So today, um, I want to begin uh, the Dharma talk by telling some real life uh, stories. And um, I worked as a spiritual care volunteer uh, in the hospital for some time, where I met a bunch of uh, cancer patients. Um, and I was often struck by um, the, how wide a range of ways that people uh, see um, their situation and this um, situation of having cancer diagnosis and how different ways of relating and seeing their experiences have changed their lives. And so, of course, uh, a lot of times the common uh, ways of relating, perceiving and this kind of a situation um, oftentimes initially is that of a fear, um, maybe anger, dread, resistance, uh, blame, um, why me, and et cetera. But there are also uh, other kind of um, ways of seeing this as well. One cancer patient who had a late stage lung cancer, uh, when he first heard this news from uh, the doctor's office, um, the, um, the doctor was very um, uncomfortable telling him this news. So um, this patient, uh, when he saw the doctor uh, the way he was, and he paused and it said to this doctor something like this. So he said, oh doctor, I know this must be uh, really challenging for you to communicate news like this to the patients. Please take your time. And so instead of dreading the news that he just got, uh, he saw this as an opportunity to um, extend his compassion to this doctor a doctor who was struggling in telling this news to him. Another patient um, said this after her breast cancer diagnosis. And she said, I put myself on a mission. I tell myself that this disease is not going to get the best of me. My prayer every day is that God shows me how I can be a blessing to others. And so that was um, how she related to this. And she saw this as an opportunity uh, to be a blessing to others. Uh, one uh, other patient uh, saw her last stage of her life due to uh, pancreatic cancer as the best time in her life because she let go of all the things that weren't meaningful to her whatsoever. And she was a sunshine in the uh, infusion room. And she, whenever she was there doing her chemo session, uh, she was always doing loving kindness uh, practice to everybody. The nurses loved her. And so for me, um, oftentimes sitting next to um, uh, patients and people like this really bring a sense of divine, a kind of a, a sense of a divine all around everybody. I'm sure that you've heard a lot of stories like this, but for me personally, having this opportunity to meet people like this uh, in real life has really opened me up in terms of how I see the situations uh, that I meet, the challenges I meet. I oftentimes ask myself, can there be other ways of seeing my situation? So today, I want to make a somewhat a provocative statement, maybe not a very provocative for many of you, but um, 
and may feel provocative in some sense. And this statement is this. Every experience in life can be seen in endless ways. And some ways of seeing, some ways of perceiving our experiences can lead to welfare and well-being to us and to others. And there are some ways of seeing and perceiving, relating our experience that can lead to harm and lead to stress and lead to the opposite of well-being to ourselves and others. And see if this is true for you in your own lived experience. And a big part of the Dharma practice has to do with um, seeing, observing, paying attention, opening up to see new ways in the new ways of seeing. And the, um, I know that Gil sometimes, Gil Fransto, uh, our teacher here, sometimes say that mindfulness practice is not about seeing new things. Rather, it is about seeing things in new perspectives. And so our um, practice has a lot to do with learning to see, observe, and learning to pay attention. Learning to see in the ways that can support us uh, in our own well-being and others. Learning to um, see the ways that can lead to challenges and uh, harm in us. And an illness uh, can be seen sometimes um, as um, something unwanted, undesirable, painful, disabling, and there may be a source of um, many misfortune in the life. Uh, for example, loss of, um, loss of relationships, loss of jobs, uh, loss of a physical and a mental capacity, and even loss of simple pleasures like going out for a hike. I use illness as an example, but you can easily change this as other difficulties that you may be meeting or other challenges in life and it can easily be replaced just like uh, just like this and and I'm using uh, illness uh, in this talk as an analogy and at the say those are common perspectives that we have and common uh, common ways of relating to a challenge and an illness and there's a lot of truth to it. I don't want to dismiss this. Uh, for me, um, personally, having a chronic uh, pain. And there are definitely moments that I see uh, myself um, reacting and seeing this as just unwanted, undesirable. I don't want it. I'd rather it to go away. But through the Dharma practice, I know that I can also open myself up to see this with some new perspectives. One of the perspectives that you may be seeing this is that of an opportunity to pause and to look. Can an illness or a difficulty or a challenge be seen as an opportunity to pause and to look, and maybe to slow down and to look, like a driving through a stretch of uh, rumble strips. Uh, uh, a friend who shared this image last week, um, it was very vivid, and so it stuck in my head. <laughs> so today I'm going to share this as well. Like rumble or rumble strip, driving through rumble strip. And many people can probably relate uh, to this, that nowadays a lot of people um, 
living their lives by running really fast at very fast speed. Maybe from the grade school、uh, times all the way up till when、uh, we can no longer no longer run at fast speed, whether due to illnesses or maybe kind of due to a pandemic like what we have right now. Challenge in life. And we know that、uh, sometimes, even when people are ill, they wouldn't stop running at very high speed. They wouldn't stop speeding ahead. A lot of times, and this kind of a non-stop speeding ahead in life is a lifelong pattern that we developed. We conditioned ourselves to do to do so. And、when we hit a challenge like this, that may be out、uh, outside of our own control, can we use this as an opportunity to stop, to pause, to slow down, and then to look, look at the situation, look at how our lives has been for us. I know for many people, our fast speed life can look like、um, I don't know Google Calendar. You know, our our lives controlled by by our calendar. Is your life like a schedule? You know, half an hour after this, we're going to do half an hour of this. Or is your life? Spacious. Do you feel some ease with the life that you're living? And so that's one way of seeing, which is,、um, can we see an illness as an opportunity to pause and to take a look? And another opportunity、uh, to see, another way of seeing is: Can an illness or a challenge be seen as a gift bestowed upon us? I know in my cancer group,、um, and there was this person who、um, oftentimes shared an outpouring sense of gratitude and love that she received, and she also transmitted that. To whoever she meets, for me it felt like a gift that she's been offering to everyone. And so, can this be、um, a gift to us? And that's another way of relating and seeing a challenge and illness. Rumi, in his famous、um, poem "Guest House." Invited us to see our experience as a guide from beyond. Can an illness be seen as a guide from beyond? What can we learn from those experiences? It doesn't mean that we always have to see things this ways, but rather. When we began to open up to new ways of seeing, and there are new ways of seeing becoming available to us, it can begin to soften some of the old beliefs that we may have about how we always supposed to relate to our experiences this way. Especially when everyone else around us seems to be relating to our experiences the same way. It kind of reinforces the ways that we may have believed in. But when we begin to open ourselves up to some of these new perspectives that we may not have had the chance to touch to see, it began to soften and loosen our grip to some of the fixed ideas that we may have. And so maybe over time 
will get to learn some wiser ways of seeing our experiences that can really support us and open us up to some sense of well-being. Now the statement I made about that every experience in life can be seen in endless ways applies in both big events, um, significant events, as well as momentary experiences. And so after all, our mindfulness training um, our mindfulness practice that many of us engaged in in just the last half an hour when we uh, did um, meditation. We're practicing the ways of seeing, practicing seeing, seeing our momentary experiences and bigger events. In the momentary experiences, for example, a moment of anxiety that bubbles up inside of us. Maybe the immediate um, habitual tendency of relating to anxiety and that just bubbled up inside of us, um, like intimidation. You know, I had a moment of intimidation. I've never done this uh, YouTube live uh, streaming before. Um, uh, the habitual reaction could be that of, um, I don't like this. It's not wanted here. I'd rather get rid of it. Or it could be something like, oh, I'm, I'm an anxious person. I'm always anxious. That could be, you know, some ways of relating to a situation like this. But can there be other ways of seeing? A moment of anxiety could be seen just as a wave of emotion, a wavelet of emotion that's bubbling up inside of us. We can also drop into our body to feel how that feels it, how that feels in the body. a moment of um, anxiety, maybe sensed as some tightness around the neck and the shoulders, some tension on the face. And as we began to open up um, our inner vision, inner awareness, to closely observe this kind of experiences, and we began, we may begin to see that our bodies naturally wanted to relax. There's a natural body movement towards relaxation. It takes a lot of work to kind of hold the tension in the body. And we may also see as the body relaxes, anxieties might fade away. And so those can be different ways, different ways of seeing our experiences as well. Without adding additional stories that we might be telling ourselves or more complexities that we may be adding. And as we pay attention to the momentary anxiety, um, there may also be other perspectives about this process of or, or the movements of anxiety. And that is this momentary emotion comes and goes. And they come and go not under my control. So maybe opposite to what we may have a belief in, which is I'm always angry, or I'm always anxious, I'm always fearful. It's simply a process that comes and goes. And as we pay more attention to just this simple experience of having anxiety, 
we may also begin to open up to see that the arising of this kind of emotions is not totally random. And the fading away of this kind of anxiety and emotions are not totally random. There are patterns or conditions that leads to the anxiety to come about. And then there are patterns and um, conditions that leads to the fading away of anxiety. And for example, I think many of us probably have this kind of experience before already. In the moment of anxiety, when you see it's present, um, you may begin to notice that if you try hard to tinker with your anxiety, trying to fix it, get rid of it, or escape from it, you're just getting more and more panicky. It just worsens the situation. But if, um, if you simply notice that anxiety is present and maybe dropping into your body, and this very simple observation without any, adding any additional juice, juicy stories on top of it, will begin to allow our emotions to move about. And emotions are basically movements, movements in the body, movements in the mind. It's in their nature to move about but only if we give a lot of space for it to move about. And so you may begin to see this kind of pattern. Um, that uh, our self-centered control and ma manipulation tends to worsen our anxiety and fear while simple and a kind mindfulness and can begin to allow our emotions to move through. And so those different ways of seeing can begin to allow ourselves to relate to our experiences in some new ways. We'll learn to observe and see things in ways that can free us from getting knotted up with our experience. In the Buddhist teachings, uh, finding skillful ways of seeing our experience is a key part of Dharma training. And it begins by pause and stop to look. In uh, the middle length discourses and the first sutta, uh, in this Middle Lands discourses, the Buddha talked about the several categories of the people based on how they perceived their experiences. The first category, untrained, ordinary people, they would see their experiences in their physical body that's made up of earth, water, air, and a fire. The and some of you may know that the material elements, they would see their experiences as, or their element, uh, elemental materials as, this is my body, this is me, I am this. And so Buddha calls, this is um, uh, the categories of the people who are untrained, their mind is untrained. So there's a habitual way of seeing everything through the lens of I, me, my. And they take delight in this, which leads to much stress. And, um, you know, the Pali term that we oftentimes say is dukkha. And then the second category that the Buddha talked about are those uh, people who uh, are undergoing the Dharma training, like all of us who are uh, practicing um, Dharma, but may, 
not have, but have not completed training. And so to them, they see their experiences just as experience. They relate to the elemental material aspects of the being just as such. The solid bones as bones. The air we breathe, just air. Without adding more complications to it. And they know they should not perceive this as I, me, mine, because that leads to a lot of stress. So if you're really interested in exploring these different ways of seeing, new ways of seeing, just even try this. As you breathe, can you precisely define when exactly the air that you breathe in has become you? And as you breathe out, when is, when is the air no longer you? In your lived experience, can you define this? And for me, I can't find those kind of boundaries. So can, how can we claim then the air that we breathe in is mine? Uh, it is me, I am this. And so this new ways of seeing can break us free from the habitual ways of relating to our experiences from fixed set of views, fixed set of boundaries. And, the, uh, and the, another category that Buddha talked about is those who completed the training, uh, who are the arahants. They do not perceive or see the, their experiences as I mean mine. And the boundaries have completely dissolved for them. I feel quite inspired because when the boundaries dissolve, if we really care deeply about our own well-being, how can we not care about the nature around us, the people around us? After all, we can't find the boundaries so solidly. And so I close by saying also that um, the different ways of seeing are not the things that we can control or we man manipulate in our head, you know, we kind of beat our head up and saying we better see these things in some new different ways. But rather, it's a process for us to open our inner vision up to become available so that then when new perspectives uh, emerge in us, we begin to see them. They become available. And an analogy I use uh, to describe this is like when you go to uh, the optometrist um, to do your peripheral vision test. When you put your eye uh, in front of that little scope uh, to uh, do your peripheral vision test, you don't fix your vision on any specific thing, but you keep your vision open. And so that anything flickers through, you will see them. Yeah? So, uh, so this way of um, cultivating different perspectives is kind of like that. We keep our inner vision open, wide open to allow different perspectives to come about. And so I'll end by saying that may we all keep our inner vision wide open. And may we all learn the wise ways of seeing that sets us free. Thank you, everybody.